A lot of folks seem to think the schools were just perfect before the Department of Education came along. We didn't even have it until 1979 and everything was fine. But here's the thing. Everything was not fine unless you were white and rich and male. Kids with disabilities, often ignored. Schools in low income areas, wildly underfunded. And for millions of kids, your zip code could pretty much make or break your education. Now there's this big push to get rid of the Department of Education. And I'm here to ask, are we really ready to throw away the only federal safeguard keeping our schools even remotely fair? In this video, I'm breaking down what the department actually does, why axing it would be a huge step backwards, and what's really at stake for students across the country. So let's get into it. And let's clear up some confusion. While it's easy to remember the past through a nostalgic lens, the truth is that before the Department of Education, there were far fewer protections and resources for many of our most vulnerable students. These are students in low-income areas, students with disabilities, and minority students. Federal involvement helps make sure that all students in every state no matter their background or ability, have the opportunity to receive a quality education. Let's take it all the way back. Back in early America, schooling was a mess. Most kids didn't even go unless they were wealthy, white, or male. And some towns started offering free schooling, but that was pretty rare. The founding fathers though knew that if democracy was going to work, people needed to be educated. Thomas Jefferson, for example, wanted a public school system so people could make wise decisions, vote, and spot tyranny. So critical thinking was even an issue in the 1700s. Imagine, in the 1830s, education reformers like Horace Mann promoted the concept of common schools. Common schools would be open to all children, non-religious, free of charge, and funded by the state. Mann and others believed that a publicly funded education system would benefit the entire nation, transforming children into literate, moral, and productive citizens. These common schools aim to prepare students for both citizenship and work, teaching subjects like reading, arithmetic, and history, and providing moral instruction. Mann believed that education was essential to democracy, just like the founding fathers. He also believed that educated individuals could better contribute to the workforce, improve their economic conditions, and boost the nation's prosperity. So he saw education as a tool for social mobility, providing individuals particularly those from low-income backgrounds with opportunities for self-improvement and stable employment. He argued that the cost of educating children for free was far lower than the expenses associated with punishing criminals or dealing with social issues stemming from poverty. Mann's advocacy for public schools was controversial in ways that might sound familiar to you. For example, he angered many religious groups. People also rejected the idea of tax-funded schools. Some people felt like his common school system represented of government overreach because it shifted control over education from local communities to the state. Mann's emphasis on moral education and civic responsibility was also controversial because some people thought moral education was the role of the family or the church, not school. And this was pre-Civil War, people, and we are still seeing objections like this to public school today. At the same time, though, Mann promoted the idea of a universal education. However, his vision was limited by racial and social prejudices of the time. The common school movement often did not include children of color, particularly African American, indigenous, and immigrant children. In the South and other regions, public education remained segregated or inaccessible to minority children. So the movement wasn't genuinely inclusive and it failed to address deep-seated inequalities. And also similarly to today, a lot of critics argued that the school system would reinforce social hierarchies instead of eliminate them because poorer schools often had less funding compared to wealthier schools. And even though access remained unequal, particularly for children of color, girls, and students with disabilities, man's ideas gradually gained traction and shaped the development of the public school system. After the Civil War, the United States faced major challenges in public education, particularly in the South. So President Andrew Johnson signed a law establishing the first Department of Education. Oh yes, we tried this before. This early department was driven by Northern lawmakers who wanted to address illiteracy and poor school conditions across the country, but particularly in the South. Education was seen as essential to rebuilding the nation and supporting newly freed African-Americans who had been enslaved. The Freedmen's Bureau 
already provided basic education to black Americans, but others in the North believed a Department of Education could ensure quality and consistency across the states. They saw it as a way to help all Americans gain access to education regardless of race. However, this original department was small, four people, and it had no power to enforce changes to schools. Its role was limited to gathering data and sharing best practices, but even this tiny role sparked fierce opposition. Some lawmakers argued that education should be left to the state, and Southern representatives worried it might push them towards racial integration. They were super scared of that, okay? So these lawmakers viewed it as like another arm of the reconstruction that would impose Northern values on them. The Northern values were racial equality, friends. So due to mounting pressure, Congress quickly downgraded the department. The lone commissioner resigned in frustration just two years after that, and the department faded from influence. Kind of. So though the department had little power, it continued to publish reports on schools, which eventually helped push for change at the state level. The first attempt hinted at a future where the federal government would play a bigger role in education, though it took another century for this to happen, over a century. In the mid 20th century, education became a priority. Federal oversight was needed to enforce changes, particularly after Brown versus the Board of Education. Federal oversight was needed to make sure that students with disabilities were not excluded. And without a federal agency, schools were not held accountable for providing an equal education for all students. So in 1979, President Jimmy Carter reinstated the Department of Education as a cabinet level agency. This created a central authority that could oversee federal education programs and hold schools accountable, unifying roles that were previously scattered across different departments. Now the Department of Education could allocate federal funding more fairly to public schools, ensure states complied with federal standards and anti-discrimination laws, could streamline access to resources and support for schools, and use research and data to advocate for improvements nationwide. The modern Department of Education aims to provide equal access to quality education for all students regardless of their background or location. And this structure allows for a more organized approach to supporting United States schools and improving educational equity. Remember, equality is everybody getting the same thing, but equity is giving everybody different things based on what they actually need to have an equal shot in the world. Because we all need different things, right? And one other thing I'll be doing very early in the administration is closing up the Department of Education in Washington, D.C., and sending all education and education work and needs back to the state. So clips like this have been going around. And one of the biggest reasons this would be bad is because schools are usually funded by property taxes. So high real estate market funding is tied to you. One reason schools in poor areas don't get as much money as rich schools is because housing in poor areas is worth less. And by the way, if you just think of urban schools, when you think of poor schools, <clears throat> rural areas, don't count yourself out. In the 2021-2022 school year, about 63% of traditional public schools and 62% of public charter schools were eligible for Title I funding. That's the funding that the federal government gives to schools to close the gap between how much money poor and rich schools get. But okay, let's get more detailed. As a whole, funding for public schools is mostly set at the state and local levels. We spend more per pupil than any nation in the world by double. First of all, no we don't, but I digress. Luxembourg pays the most per student. Okay, moving on. Here in the United States, per student spending changes state to state due to local control over funding, not federal control. And higher funding doesn't necessarily equal better outcomes either, especially because funds are unevenly distributed between states and even within school districts. Federal funding helps to close some of the gaps, but it can't make everything entirely equal. Federal funding gaps are a huge issue. Let us look at Florida. Yikes. So let's break down this funding structure. Governors propose budgets for the state, including education funding, which has to be approved by the state legislature. Governors can veto or adjust education funding, and they can advocate for changes in school funding policy. And they often work with legislatures to push their education agendas. State legislators set the state's education budget. They also decide on the funding formula, and they dole out those funds to school districts. This funding usually comes from taxes, income, sales, and property taxes, to be specific. Many states also use another formula to allocate funds to school districts. 
these formulas use things like student enrollment, the value of homes in the district, and some other things like the number of students requiring special education or the amount of English language support they need. Like I said before, a big part of school funding is local property taxes, and those are managed by local governments and school districts. The amount of taxes collected is wildly different place to place because they're based on the property value of that community. So that means rich areas get tons of money and poor areas get less. Remember this for later, please. Locally elected school boards can decide how to dole out funds within the district itself, and it can vary from school site to school site. They also decide budgets for facilities, teacher salaries, and school programs. But keep in mind, they operate within the constraints of funding provided by the state and local government. Sometimes they just do stuff. State departments of education divvy up funding based on the legislature's guidelines and they oversee the compliance of school districts with state policies. They also provide technical support to districts in using funds effectively and they monitor the adherence to state and federal funding requirements. Allegedly, they lose money all the time and they switch things up all the time. Data from 2008 to 2018 shows that students across the United States lost nearly $600 billion from states' divestment in their public schools. And this is with federal oversight from the Department of Education. Can you imagine without it? Cause I can, and that's why I'm here yapping today. The federal government, okay, they provide targeted funding and grants. Yes, that text you see on the screen says Pell Grants. Wait till I tell you about what'll happen to FAFSA. I can't say that word if we get rid of the Department of Education. Federal funding does usually come with conditions on how it has to be used. Like, hey, teach your disabled students, follow IEPs, spend this money on kids and not hire up salaries. And sometimes there are other conditions like accountability measures. So yes, like standardized testing requirements. Side note, I hate Pearson as much as the next person, but I do think some kind of benchmark for education is necessary so we can like see what's going on. We can talk about the parasitic predatory standardized testing companies soon, I promise. Also, legal rulings on funding equity can also influence school funding. So these rulings on cases are usually brought by communities that are challenging funding, saying it's inequitable. Many states have faced lawsuits over school funding, leading to courts to order the states to make changes to their funding formulas that we talked about earlier. The Department of Education also coordinates with states to provide emergency funds, resources, and guidelines to help schools navigate things like disasters, school violence, or the pandemic, which honestly states could not manage on their own due to budget constraints and lack of centralized resources. And I mean, we definitely needed more federal oversight there, but nobody knew what the heck was going on. Without the Department of Education, crisis response would fall solely on individual states, and that could lead to disorganized and uneven approaches. So for example, during future crises, rich states could quickly tap into resources and money to continue education, while states with limited budgets would struggle to keep schools open and forget about online learning. We kind of saw this happen before. So what happens if we just get rid of the Department of Education? Right now, federal funding covers about eight to 10% of K through 12 education budgets. For some states, especially those with higher poverty rates, this federal support is essential because without it, states have to figure out how to fill the gap. That means raising taxes, pulling money from other programs, or just letting education quality slip. None of which are great options, obviously. And then there's Title I funding, which funnels billions to low-income districts to help level the playing field between richer and poorer schools. So imagine taking that away. That would basically rip essential resources out of these schools, making it even harder for kids in low-income areas to get a fair shot. We're gonna talk about that so much later. And for some states, cutting federal funding could even mean slashing their public education budgets entirely, especially ones that love those school vouchers. I am coming back to that too. So we're talking about fewer resources, lower teacher salaries, and even less support for schools that are already struggling, especially in rural and low income communities. So it's not just about numbers on a spreadsheet, you guys. This will have real impact on kids and teachers and parents across the country if we get rid of the Department of Education. Allow me to emphasize again that if these federal funds vanish, states will raise taxes to keep schools running. And if you're already in a poor or rural area, yikes. 
Here's another biggie. Federal grants fund a whole range of programs that give kids a well-rounded education. Things like STEM, mental health support, arts programs, you name it. States don't always make these things a priority. So if we cut these federal grants, say bye-bye to a lot of these enrichment programs that make school more than just reading and math drills. Without the Department of Education watching over things, we could also see a boom in charter schools and private voucher programs, but with a lot less accountability. School vouchers take tax dollars meant for public education and give them to parents and say, hey, you can use these on private school tuition. With school vouchers, money follows the student no matter where they go to school instead of staying with their community. The idea is that vouchers give families a choice to send their kids to private schools instead of public ones. Supporters of vouchers believe that a free market approach in education will drive schools to compete and that this competition will drive quality up and give parents more choices. They argue that private schools can be more flexible and innovative, allowing parents to find the best fit for their kids. And plus, they think vouchers will push public schools to improve to retain students. <laughs> okay, no. Vouchers have some major downsides and when they have been used, it's not great. It's not working. When public money goes to private schools, it's pulled straight out of public schools that serve the majority of kids. And the vouchers that are allegedly for people that need help paying private school tuition, but these private schools aren't near their house, they don't have buses, they don't have free lunch, and those vouchers don't even cover the entire cost of tuition so they can't even use them anyway. They just keep their kids in public school. Duh, I would too. We already talked about how schools already are struggling with funding gaps. Vouchers just make it worse. Let's look at Arizona. Arizona has one of the broadest voucher programs in the US. They have made vouchers available statewide. Look at how their budget's doing this year because of the vouchers. Wow. Arizona public schools have seen resources dwindle, especially in low income areas where every dollar matters. These schools left behind have an uphill battle for funding, while private schools that receive these funds are not even required to meet the same transparency standards. There's no way to know where those tax dollars are even going. Or let's look at Florida. Their expansion of voucher programs has led to massive declines in public school enrollment. Major districts are considering closing schools because of funding and enrollment gaps, leaving these public schools to deal with the fallout while private schools benefit from public dollars, many of which are religious. In Arkansas, a new universal voucher program is facing challenges because the way it diverts the public school money is potentially violating the constitution. Maybe you hate public schools and you think good riddance, goodbye, close your schools. Here's another problem. Many private schools that accept vouchers don't have to meet accountability standards. So that means that they can cut corners hire less expensive teachers, less experienced teachers, and increase class sizes because they're more focused on their bottom line than a quality education. Without the Department of Education overseeing these schools, private schools receiving voucher funds don't have to report on student progress. So we're ending up with a lot of public money being spent with no way to measure if it's actually helping students. And it gets worse. Private schools that take vouchers don't always follow the same non-discrimination policies as public schools. So without federal oversight, they can exclude students with disabilities, LGBTQIA students, or students who need English language support. In a privatized voucher-driven system, schools can essentially pick who they want, leaving behind kids who need more support. So much for choice, because many families don't even have a fair shot. So these voucher programs really just blow open the door for for-profit schools. And what do for-profit schools prioritize? Spoiler alert, it's not a quality education, it's profits. Imagine that. Education is not a business. And when we treat it like one, kids lose, teachers lose, parents lose, communities lose. The future of our flipping country loses. Vouchers sound great on paper, I guess, but they actually make inequality worse. They are making our country worse. And a growing educational option is vocational training out of public schools. So if we want to see a trained workforce, we need to stop siphoning money out of public schools. You know what? Let me just be frank. There are some states that should never be left to their own devices. Corporal punishment, hitting kids, is legal in public schools in 17 states, for goodness sakes. But anyways, let's dive in. Mississippi schools don't get enough money, okay? And they often fall behind in reading and math. 
many schools need extra help to cover even the basics in Mississippi. And Mississippi also focuses less on things like health and history, so students might miss out on important information. In Texas, the testing ground for the world's most right-wing ideologies in education. Schools are very limited in what they can teach about race, LGBTQIA topics, and health. This can leave students with an incomplete picture of the world. And Texas also doesn't do much to protect LGBTQIA plus students and make sure everyone feels included. And Florida has laws that restrict talking about race, gender, and LGBTQIA topics in class, so students might not get a full or honest education there either. And some students are left out entirely or treated unfairly, and we cannot let this get worse over time by taking away the federal oversight. West Virginia has really high poverty rates, and schools rely on those extra funds to stay open. That job training that I talked talked about that vocational training is so so important in states like West Virginia and if we take away the funds for those programs it's going to make kids lives harder later on it's going to make it harder for them to find jobs and it's going to affect the West Virginia economy and our country's economy as a whole similarly in Kentucky in rural areas they are relying on these federal funds to keep going. And without federal oversight, lawmakers can do this. So let's say you have a liberal city, let's say it's Los Angeles, San Diego, and they just decide, we have new history, this is America built off the backs of slaves on stolen land. Then and that curriculum comes in. Then we don't send them money. What else will we lose without the Department of Education? Their civil rights department, for one. The Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights is what keeps schools accountable, ensuring that they follow the laws that protect students from discrimination based on race, national origin, sex, and disability. First, losing the Department of Education means losing the primary enforcer of anti-discrimination laws in school. Some schools might try to keep civil rights protections in place, but history shows us that without federal protection, those rights get watered down or ignored altogether. So here's what's at stake. Through their Office of Civil Rights, their OCR, the Department of Education enforces these rules. They are very important rules. These are laws that ensure that students get an equal shot at education regardless of their background. We're supposed to trust states with inconsistent civil rights records to just do the right thing in upholding these laws. If we leave them to their own devices, we're gonna see weaker protections or outright neglect. Students of color, LGBTQIA plus students, and students with disabilities are going to be so, so vulnerable. They are already vulnerable. Without a centralized office defending their rights, we are doing them such a disservice. And by extension, all students are being done a disservice. Also, the department plays a significant role in making sure desegregation is happening. Oh yes, we have not fully desegregated and we are always on the lookout for segregation happening in schools through things like gerrymandering. The Department of Education oversees things like court rulings that are aimed at reducing school segregation. Schools could literally resegregate intentionally or as a side effect of local policies. Schools are divided along racial lines and it's a huge issue. We're seeing socioeconomic segregation and racial segregation and they are self-fulfilling prophecies, my friends. When you have segregation in place, the rich schools get richer, the poor schools get poorer, and often there is racial overlap within that. It is a hot mess express. We need the Office of Civil Rights. Without the OCR, we are going to also miss out on a lot of protections from Title IX. The coverage of Title IX would vary wildly between states. This is going to make schools a less safe environment for many, many students. Title IX is a federal law that prohibits sex-based discrimination in schools that receive federal funding. It protects against sexual harassment and assault, and it ensures gender equity in areas like athletics and academic opportunities. Under recent administrations, the Department of Education has taken steps to affirm the rights of LGBTQIA plus students, ensuring they are protected from harassment and discrimination. Without federal oversight, you already know what I'm gonna say, this protection could essentially disappear especially with states already having such hostile attitudes towards the LGBTQI plus community. With no federal oversight stepping in to protect our students, gender affirming facilities, respectful name use, and protections against discriminatory policies would fade in less progressive states. We cannot abandon our students in red states. Let's rewind actually to see why federal oversight is essential, starting with Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. That ruled that school segregation was unconstitutional. 
but many districts found ways to dodge desegregation. They used tactics that resisted integration for years. Some states adopted massive resistance policies and school vouchers were initially used to get around this ruling. They were used by white parents who did not want to send their kids to desegregated schools. They also implemented things like school choice that left segregation largely intact. And many districts redrew school district boundary lines so that white schools stayed white and black schools stayed black. And that is another thing that we're seeing today that still exists. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 allowed the government to cut funds to segregated schools and the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965 offered funding to support integration. Federal courts also stepped up with courts mandating busing and other integration measures in the late 1960s and 1970s. But without the federal intervention, many districts would never have integrated. This shows us how essential federal oversight is for civil rights. The Department of Education does not just over see funding or curriculum. It is a literal watchdog for civil rights. And let's get into IDEA. Originally, IDEA was called Public Law 94-142. It was passed in 1975 and it required that schools receiving federal funding provided equal access and education for children with disabilities. The law mandated that schools would create individualized education programs, IEPs, for each eligible student, and they needed to meet their unique needs. This was groundbreaking, but its implementation required ongoing oversight, support, and funding. And at first, its rollout faced a lot of issues. At that time, there wasn't a Department of Education to oversee it. But once the Department of Education was established in 1979, it took on new life. The Department's Office of Special Education Programs enforced IDEA standards, provided guidance, and made sure that schools had the tools and resources to deliver on their promises. In 1990, Public Law 94-142 got its name IDEA as we know it today, and it was reauthorized. This reauthorization expanded the law's scope, added new provisions, and strengthened the services and protections for students with disabilities. Today, IDEA covers all public schools in the United States, and it supports over 7 million children, requires schools to provide a free and appropriate public education for every student with a disability. It also, again, says that they have to have IEPs that are tailored to their specific needs and those have to be followed. And students have to be taught in their least restrictive environment, meaning they should learn alongside their non-disabled peers whenever possible. IDEA also guarantees that families have a say in their child's education and they can challenge decisions if they feel their child's needs aren't being met. Though the federal government promised to cover 40% of the cost of educating students with disabilities, it currently funds only around 15% on average. So getting rid of the Department of Education would make something worse that's already been an issue. If the Department of Education were eliminated, IDEA would lose its primary enforcer and states would be left to decide how or if they support students with disabilities. If you've been paying attention, history tells us that a lot of states aren't gonna prioritize special education without oversight. Without federal oversight, IDEA's protections would weaken. This will put millions of students with disabilities at risk of losing support and accommodations they need to succeed in school. Wealthier districts might still provide services, but under-resourced areas could leave students behind, and that could undo decades of progress in disability rights and educational equity. Speaking of some equity, let's talk about Title I. Before Title I, students in low-income schools were often left to fund for themselves with outdated books, overcrowded classrooms, and fewer resources overall. You might say, but we have issues with Title I, but it was actually worse. In 1965, Title I was introduced as part of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, a huge step towards giving all kids a fair shot regardless of their zip code. Back in the day, this was a groundbreaking idea. This would bring federal money directly to schools serving low-income students, but without the Department of Education to keep an eye on things, the rollout was all over the place. Some schools got the funds, some didn't. There wasn't a clear system to track how the money was being used, but the Department of Education stepped in once it was created and Title I became more effective nationwide. This oversight 
allowed them to make sure the funds reached the schools that actually needed them. Today, Title I supports over 24 million kids each year. It funds essential things like extra teachers, tutoring, resources, and schools can use Title I dollars for school-wide programs if 40% or more of their students qualify for free or reduced lunch, and even schools below that benchmark can target students who need extra support. It's not just about keeping the lights on. It's about giving kids a real shot at success. Now here's the nightmare scenario. If we cut the Department of Education, Title I would likely lose its funding and oversight. That means a lot of things, larger class sizes, bigger gaps between richer and poorer areas. We are taking away a lifeline for millions of students who depend on these programs, bringing us right back to the days when educational quality was a luxury, not a right, which it is, it's a right. Both Title I and IDEA are designed to make sure that all students get a fair shot, whether they come from low-income families or need special education services. The Department of Education isn't just a figurehead, okay? It is the backbone that makes sure these programs actually work. We need the oversight, we need the consistent funding, and it cannot vary wildly state to state. Students will pay the price here. And English language learners who make up more than 10% of our country's public school students. The Department of Education mandates that school provide meaningful access to education for English language learners. Additionally, Title III of the Every Student Succeeds Act allocates funds specifically for English language learner programs, making sure that students have these resources and qualified staff that they need. If we let the states just take this over, we're gonna get patchy support and patchy coverage for our ELs across the country. Emergent bilingual students are so, so, so important and they have every right to a quality education. We already see English only policies. The opposition to bilingual education and immigration in general does not leave me feeling confident that states would just support this massive demographic of students if they were just left to their own devices. Related to this, the Department of Education funds training for teachers in culturally responsive teaching. Many states already face shortages of qualified EL teachers. Without the Department of Education funded training programs, we're not gonna see the professional development needed to effectively teach EL teachers how to teach ELs. This would lead to slower language acquisition and increased inequities in schools for our EL students. And the Department of Education helps make sure that from state to state and district to district, there are supports in place for our English language learner students. So maybe if they go to a different state, they're able to continue their education versus going to a new state and having no one to help them. This will reduce the number of future bilingual citizens in the United States and those citizens contribute to the workforce in community in ways that are extremely important. And speaking of the workforce, let's talk about access to higher education. In the 1960s and 70s, the dream of higher education was out of reach even more than it is today, especially for our low income students. Costs were rising and financial aid was limited. The Department of Education played a critical role in changing this landscape. And they created programs like Pell Grants and federal student loans, making it possible for millions of students from low income and middle class families to attend college. Currently, Pell Grants are managed by the Department of Education. They are a cornerstone of federal financial aid and they make college accessible to so many. But without the Department of Education, funding would be left to individual states, leading to inconsistency in availability and amount. Out. Many students would lose this vital support, potentially leading to a drop in college enrollment and increased financial strain because states with fewer resources might be unable to fund such programs and that could worsen income related disparities in higher education access. And this is something we already know is bad. A big question everyone has asked me is, will my student loans go away at least? No. The Department of Education does oversee the federal student loan program and they manage repayment plans, deferment, and forgiveness options. But all that would happen is states now would need to manage student loans independently. This could result in increased interest rates, reduced protections for borrowers, and fewer options for deferment and forgiveness. Students would face varying levels of loan accessibility depending on their state, which probably would deter many people from even entering college in the first place. And we would lose FAFSA. 
FAFSA. I can't say that word. I always just said FAFSA, but that's not it. Anyways, FAFSA is managed by the Department of Education. It's the gateway for students to access federal financial aid, including Pell Grants, work study programs, and federal student loans. It is a one-stop application that determines eligibility for multiple options of federal aid and even some state and institutional scholarships. So obviously without the Department of Education, there would be no centralized application. You would need to apply separately for any state level or institution specific aid, as well as just like aid in general and scholarships. That would be a pain in the butt that might deter a lot of people from applying in the first place. And things like work study or subsidized loans, those are gonna become decentralized. Students would lose streamlined access to essential aid, especially in states that might not prioritize higher education funding because somebody, I don't know, is calling them woke all the time. When I return to the White House, I will fire the radical left accreditors that have allowed our colleges to become dominated by Marxist maniacs and lunatics. And teachers, we have not forgotten about you. Let's talk about what would happen to teacher employment across the nation if we get rid of the Department of Education. The Department of Education provides essential funding to states and school districts, particularly through programs like Title I that support schools with high percentages of low-income students. In the fiscal year 2023, the Department of Education's budget was approximately $88 billion, a substantial portion of which directly supports K-12 education. The proposed fiscal year 2025 budget by House Republicans included a 25% reduction in Title I funding, and that would result in the loss of jobs for approximately 72,000 teaching positions nationwide. Imagine if the Department of Education is eliminated entirely. It's hard to figure out exactly how many teachers we would lose, but let's not forget that student learning environments are teacher working environments. When the resources, policies, and protections that help students succeed are removed, teachers feel the impact directly. The Department of Education plays a huge role in supporting teachers, believe it or not, helps them fund their classroom and protect their rights. Without it, teachers would face a less supportive, more unstable work environment, ultimately affecting students too. The Department of Education also funds professional development programs that help teachers improve their skills and keep up with new educational standards and better support their students. These programs are often funded under Title II and they provide workshops, training, and opportunities for teachers to advance their careers. States could pretty much do whatever they want if there isn't federal oversight for that. Like, uh, this. We already have an issue in this country with class sizes being kind of massive. States can just do whatever they want with the class sizes. Smaller class sizes we know leads to a better environment for students and a more manageable workload for teachers. Crowded classrooms make it almost impossible to manage student behaviors and individualized education plans, which we need to follow because it's the law. The added strain of giant class sizes lead to burnout rates and reduce job satisfaction for teachers and students lose qualified educators who leave the profession. And the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights also helps out teachers. Without the Department of Education's Civil Rights Office, protections of teachers will fall to individual states, which some of them have inconsistent records on upholding civil rights. Teachers could face discrimination and harassment with limited resource, particularly in states without strong employee protections or unions. The Department of Education is also working hard to stabilize the teacher job market. We need to be training and retaining teachers. But without the Department of Education's support, we could even see things like layoffs or school closures. And I just wanna address, yes, we obviously have some problems in education, but eliminating the Department of Education would take one of the few safety nets away from students, teachers, and parents. This is not about ignoring problems that we have now, but we need to recognize that without federal oversight, these challenges would become much harder, if not impossible to address. All right, let's talk about saving the Department of Education. Remember, one time Donald Trump tried to ax the Affordable Care Act. He went at it with everything he had, but we fought back, we showed up and we made some noise and guess what? The ACA is still here because we made it clear that we needed it. Now here we are again, but this time it's the Department of Education on the chopping block. People might shrug and say, so what, who needs it? But here's the deal, we all need it. The Department of Education isn't just some broad agency. It funds our schools, it protects students' civil rights, and it ensures that all students get the resources that they need. If we lose it, every single one of the issues we already have will get worse. So how do we save it? 
Tell everybody you know about what the Department of Education actually does. A lot of people have no clue how it enforces basic protections or funds their kids' schools. Also, please share your story. People listen when things get personal. So if you or somebody you know has been helped by federal funding or civil rights protections in schools, share it. These real stories make it so that people understand why the Department of Education matters. And call your reps. Let them know. We are watching. They have a lot to lose if they try to mess with our schools. So join forces with groups fighting for teachers. Check out what local organizations are doing in your area and get the message out loud and clear. And I gotta tell you, the power of social media is no joke. You can share, 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 share things, okay? The more people that see what's happening, the harder it is to ignore. So yes, we have been here before. They came for our health care, and we fought back. So we can do it again with the Department of Education. This isn't just a nice to have. This department keeps our schools funded and our kids protected and our teachers supported. So we're gonna make sure they hear us. And okay, common argument. We can just move everything that the Department of Education does to the states. They can just do it in other departments, no big deal. Been there, tried that. Remember, we talked about that. The Department of Education is specialized. Its entire purpose is education and is staffed by people that understand the needs of schools, students, teachers, and administrators. Tossing educational responsibilities over to unrelated departments is like asking a, ch a chef to do heart surgery, okay? Maybe they know some of the basics, they can cut things, but they lack expertise and it's gonna show. The Department of Education is not just a funding source also. We can't just delegate funding to the states. It's about upholding standards and protections for all students. Trying to spread these responsibilities across multiple agencies means there's no central accountability. Who makes sure kids with disabilities get the resources and funding they need? Who ensures equal funding for low-income schools? If you break it up, these protections start falling through the cracks and the oversight is like poof, gone. The Department of Education also makes sure that funds go where they'll have the most impact. They have a whole lot of data to make sure that they're giving it to the right places. This is also a way that we provide consistency across the country to make sure that every student has access to a baseline quality of education, no matter where you go or where you move. Do you support our troops? Because they move a whole lot, okay? Just saying. A patchwork approach is just a recipe for chaos. States certainly have different priorities as we have seen. And also let's not let history repeat itself. We have seen what happens without federal oversight. I've said it like 19 million times over the past hour of this video. <laughs> to wrap things up, the Department of Education isn't just a nice to have. It is the backbone of our education system that works to keep things fair, safe, and equal. Today, the Department of Education is home to 17 specialized offices, each laser focused on specific parts of our education system. Together, those offices tackle everything from special education to civil rights, from overseeing federal funding to ensuring English language learners get the support they need. They don't just throw money around. They are setting standards. They are creating programs that level the playing field to make sure that all of our kids have access to success, no matter their background or their zip code. And the elimination of the department is not going to be a magic fix for the issues that we already have. So let's make sure it stays, evolves, it keeps doing what it was built to do. Give every student a fair shot. Bye.